I think I've got my slideshow ready. All right. So our story begins, well, it begins in a lot of places, but I, of course, like to start it with Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. Um, and this is, uh, you see, our our bold tonsured monk nailing his 95 theses to the church door, which may or may not have happened, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a great story and uh, a wonderful starting point. Uh, do not have time to go into incredible detail about the Reformation and the conflict in question actually takes place between a Catholic monarch and the Pope. So you would think that the Protestant Reformation doesn't have a ton to do with this, but it does. And it's an important backdrop to everything that's happening. The Protestant Reformation does a lot of different things and it coincides with, as we all know, the, not just the invention, but more the adoption of the printing press uh, as a, means of communication, which allows for an awful lot of things to happen. And there are a lot of effects that both the uh, users and inventors of the printing press and we as uh, observers can't really fully understand. Uh, its effects are broad, wide reaching, complicated uh, and very, very deep. Uh, it impacts all areas of European society, but it allows for a lot of things um and it ultimately results in an awful lot of social disruption. And this coincides with a period of consolidation. One of the other things that the printing press enables, or at least accelerates, is um, the creation of, or the consolidation of power from a lot of small individual states into a at this time period, a, a group of ruling dynasties. And so uh, this is when you begin to see the emergence of um, the Habsburgs, Bourbons, uh, House of Valois, uh, which you know doesn't come out in the end. Uh, the um, Union of Castile and Aragon, um, the consolidation of England um, under the uh, under the Lancasters, uh, York, whatever. Um, end of the War of Roses, I mean, the consolidation, uh, eventually under the Tudors, you know, uh, there's, again, a lot of reasons why this is happening, and I do not want to uh, downplay it, but I want to emphasize that this is not distinct from the Reformation, uh, and these are all sort of like interconnected processes. Uh, and so one of the major uh, figures to emerge from this time period, uh, this t period of consolidation, is um, where's my button? I'm a little rusty. Uh, is Maximilian? Um, and this is not a picture of Maximilian. This is a picture of Maximilian, Maximilian's dominions. This is Maximilian the first Holy Roman Emperor. Now Maximilian. Uh, is head of the House of Habsburg, which, as you may know, were the rulers of Austria. And they had been the rulers of Austria for a while, but things started to pick up for the Habsburgs in the late 15th century. Um, Maximilian was, um, was again, uh, he became Holy Roman Emperor, and I suppose I should... Well, I'm not going to talk too much about the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, the joke is that it was uh, none of the above, neither holy nor Roman nor really an empire. All you really need to know is that the emperor had some loose control over all of the states of the, the Holy Roman Empire, which included basically all of Germany, some of Italy, parts of what are now the Netherlands and Belgium, the power that the emperor wielded over these states varied radically throughout the existence of the Holy Roman Empire, um, but it was substantial and it was important. And more significantly than his title as Holy Roman Emperor, Maximilian, like I mentioned, was um, head of the House of Habsburg, ruled over Austria, but he also inherited the lands of Burgundy through his wife, Mary of Burgundy, daughter of Charles the Bold, Duke of Burgundy. 
Burgundy is a non-existent state that included, um, as you can see here, parts of the Netherlands, uh, Switzerland, uh, Luxembourg, um, what is now Alsace-Lorraine, Alsace um, basically parts of Western Germany uh, and the Low Countries uh, and a little bit of uh, Switzerland. Uh, it was a pretty powerful duchy, but uh, Charles the Bold got himself killed. He caught the business end of a Swiss halberd at the Battle of Nancy in 1477. Um, he was fighting some dumb shit war over some dumb shit piece of land. Uh, and even though he was a pretty good duke as far as, you know, uh, real politic ruling uh, with an iron fist goes, um, he got unlucky and got killed by uh, a Swiss pikeman. Uh, and had no heir, so his lands passed to Mary of Burgundy and through her to Maximilian I. Now, Maximilian rules over some of the most valuable and powerful lands of the Holy Roman Empire and of Europe in general, and he spends most of his reign as Holy Roman Emperor either trying to secure those lands or uh, expand them. Uh, and this involves all kinds of, again, little dumb shit wars against little dumb shit Duchies, um, it is a bunch of shifting loyalties and tiny states going to war with tiny states. Um, but ultimately, Maximilian secures these, you know, Habsburg dominions. He has uh, several children, including Charles V, more on him later, and Philip the Handsome, who married Joanna, daughter of Isabella and Ferdinand of Castile and Aragon, who you may recall. Uh, among other things, some guy named Columbus was in there, but also they unified um, the Iberian Peninsula, or most of it, into Spain, uh, uniting the two kingdoms uh, once and for all. Um, this is not important, but for reference, this is what Philip the Handsome looks like. If you were ever wondering if you are good-looking enough to be a late Renaissance medieval monarch, you are. You would probably be called whoever the beautiful. So just bear that in mind when you're listening to me talk about uh, old-timey monarchs. So uh, another important member of our Dramatis Personae is Clement VII, uh, who was Pope in 1527. Uh, he was head of the Catholic Church and ruler of the Papal States from 1523 uh, until his death in 1534. He was born Giulio, Giulio de' Medici. Um, his cousin, Giovanni de' Medici, had been Pope as well, Leo X. Uh, Clement, however, lacked his cousin's ruthlessness and skill at statecraft and has been called the most unfortunate of popes. He was even less competent than Alexander VI, uh, also better known as Rodrigo de Borgia. Um, and this is important because for the past hundred years or so, the Papal States and the, the papacy had been controlled by powerful Italian families. And far be it from me to uh, impugn the um, sanctity of the Holy See uh, and the papacy itself, but they were certainly more mm, temporal in their concerns than... I think popes are expected to be. Um, they were very, very involved in matters of finance and of the flesh. Uh, and the papal states had a pretty substantial power. Like they had, they had armies. They controlled a, a significant amount of land, and they were a a state in their own right in this time period, uh, more so than they had been before, and frankly, more than they would be for a long time. Um. But at this time, Clement VII is kind of on the bad end of a series of alliances, and he's having a lot of trouble uh, for reasons that we will get into in greater detail in a minute. But first, I want to talk to you about Landschnecht. So Landschnecht are um, these um, excellent, very cool-looking guys in their puffy shirts and uh, pantaloons, uh, excellent hats. Um, and this was 
these were not the um, only uh, military force in the, in the time period, but they are they are significant. And these the Landschnecht were German speaking mercenaries um, who began to emerge in the late fifteenth, early sixteenth century. Now, throughout the medieval period, war had been done by all sorts of people, but largely by peasant levies supporting noble knights. But some things started to change that calculation, uh, as you undoubtedly are aware. One of those is gunpowder. Though it is not as significant as you would think until later in this time period, but it does not help that even a highly armored knight can suddenly catch a, you know, arquebus shot and die. Uh, as significant, or perhaps more significant, is the emergence of uh, the pike formation. And the Landschnecht are especially good at this pike formation. Um, pikes, again, long, pointy spears, are very, very good for stopping charging knights, which begins to change the calculation of warfare. Uh, again, more significant than handheld firearms is the widespread adoption of cannon, which also makes siege warfare suddenly um, obsolete because you can just blow the shit out of most walls, uh, even with a rudimentary cannon. And so warfare begins to change. Now, the thing about pike and pike and shot especially is that you need to be disciplined to do it. You have to be able to hold a formation. You have to be able to, to stand up to charging knights. Um, so there's a move towards professionalization and there's a move towards using mercenaries because you need professional troops. And even if you have a bunch of relatively uh, strapping, hardworking, you know, motivated peasants, they're not going to be as good at marching in formation and standing up and uh, staying calm in the face of violence. Uh, and so during this time period, during the turn of the 16th, uh, late 15th century, you see a lot of mercenary companies emerge and they will fight on every side. The Swiss are substantial here. There's the Landschnecht uh, and there's a lot of Italian mercenaries. And these troops tend to just sort of move back and forth. And if you want to be competitive in the cutthroat European Game of Thrones, you really need to be able to hire these mercenaries. And so in this period, warfare really becomes about who has the deeper pockets, who can keep these extremely expensive mercenary companies in the field for longer. And that means that for short wars, some small states can compete, but that it ends up being really a battle of treasuries between France and the Holy Roman, Holy Roman Empire and the Italian states and sometimes England and Spain, but really whoever has the cashy money to hire a bunch of fancy lads like this to fight other fancy lads from other parts of Europe. And there's an interesting element of this because the monarchs of the... Uh, 15th and 16th centuries are constantly fucking broke. They are broke all the time. And the reason why they are broke, well, there's a lot of reasons for this. Largely, it's be it, it, ultimately, it's because they are expanding their states and they are uh, increasing state capacity. Uh, yes, being a mercenary was a normal ass job. It was a good job. Um, a mercenary could expect to make more than an artisan um, twice as much as a day laborer. Yes, it was dangerous and violent, but if you got lucky, you could, you know, work for five to ten years uh, and basically retire. And a lot of dudes did. Um, and, you know, a lot of it was just marching around and threatening people who were not fighting back. There weren't a ton of... This isn't true. There weren't always a ton of pitched battles where you could expect to get murdered. Um, a lot of it was uh, extracting... Uh, threatening people, extracting wealth, and uh, beating up on much smaller, much less um, well-equipped armies. This was a... Mer mercenary work was a good job, especially if you were a, a Swiss or, or German, uh, especially if you were not a first son. 
and you couldn't expect to inherit a lot of wealth. Uh, this was, you know, your options were all sorts of things, but, um, you know, you could be, you could join the church or you could, um, you know, go into civil service, but uh, a, a excellent way to um, make a name for yourself. And this was a relatively honorable profession as far as these things go was was being a mercenary i think it was fun for a lot of guys there was uh patrick wyman talks a lot about a guy named uh gores uh von berlichen uh and let me see if i can find a picture of him uh, he got his hand blown off uh by a cannon but he spent his whole life just being a mercenary and he seemed to love the work let me see if i can find a picture of this guy yeah Gotts Berlingen. Anyway, um, I think for a lot of guys, it was a lot of fun. Anyway, um, monarchs of the time period were constantly broke. They were expanding state capacity. They were uh, doing colonization. They were building stuff up. Uh, there was a lot of growth in this time period. It was very, very expensive. and needed to finance it somehow. And they never had enough gold or silver Um I am back. Hello, everyone. Uh, they never had enough gold or silver to finance the things that they wanted to finance. And the reason for that, there's a lot of reasons for that, but the biggest reason is that Europe at this time period had a massive trade deficit with the East. China especially, but India as well, had a endless need for mostly silver bullion to, to mint new coins. Um, and so they would acquire this silver from uh, increasingly Europe, especially as um, the mines in places like Peru, uh, Potosi, and elsewhere start to, um, you know, ship it back across the ocean. But Europe had absolutely nothing that China and India wanted except for precious metals. Um, there were a l few... Textiles made in the very finest parts of Germany. Um, yeah, they, they were trading for spices, for silks, for, um, I think, mostly spices and silks, to other textiles, um, all the tea, all sorts of things. I mean, uh, the East had lots of shit that Europe wanted. Europe had nothing. Uh, and so it was just a constant flow of uh, silver bullion especially, but silver and gold to the east. And so the monarchs of Europe had to get very, very creative when it came to financing uh, the, especially these wars, but really everything. And this is when you really begin to see the emergence of debt as a vehicle for state growth. And I've talked about that elsewhere, and I... It's it's kind of underlies everything. And I talk, you know, this is a big part of when I talked about the uh, financing of the um, the Bank of England and how it was used to build a fleet. Uh, this is both innovative and has a lot of unintended consequences, which we're going to see in just a moment. But uh, basically, even though for the vast majority of European history, um Usury has been a uh, extremely um, a, a grave sin and a punishable offense. People start to people monarchs, but also everybody starts to use debt as a way to finance things more and more often. And like I mentioned, part of that is the Reformation. And it's not this simple. It's not like suddenly there are Protestants and they're willing to lend at usurious rates, but this is part of of what changes the dynamic and uh, increases the prevalence of money lending. There are a lot of private actors who lend to these monarchs and they are in debt to them and they make promises, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of monarchs will hire mercenaries with promises of payment later because they just simply do not have the funds and they probably will, but Sometimes those funds never appear and then bad things happen. So in this time period, there's what are called the Italian Wars. And basically these are 
previews to the or precursors to the big dynastic wars of the future, they're really about a conflict mostly between the Holy Roman Empire and France over control of parts of Italy. Um, but in 1494, Charles VIII of France invades Naples in 1594 uh, over a dynastic claim. Um, J. Betty, yes, this is this is being driven largely by wealthy traders. Um, there's some some goods, uh, and and by the nobility largely, there are some goods that um, that the working classes can enjoy, but not many. This isn't like sugar. This isn't this isn't like the trade deficit or the trade is being driven by the needs of the working class. This is largely. Uh, the emerging bourgeoisie and the nobility um, gaining an increased appetite for luxury goods uh, is is exactly right. Um, so in 1494, Charles VIII, he thinks he has a claim to the throne of um, Naples and Sicily um, and invades. However, uh, Venice forms an alliance with... Uh, good old Maximilian uh, of Austria and Ferdinand V of Spain when he is forced to retreat. Then again, in 1499, Charles's son, Louis, Louis XII of France, attacks again, uh, trying to take... Uh, he seizes the Duchy of Milan uh, thanks to the influence of Cesare Borgia, uh, son of Pope Alexander VI and Condottiero. He's a Condottiero. Con, 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 I'm sorry, everybody. I thought I knew how to say that word. I don't think I've ever said condottieri or condottiero out loud until just this moment. Anyway, I'll practice next time. Uh, he was a mercenary uh, armed servant for Louis the Twelfth. Um, this basically marks an open alliance between the, the Pope and France uh, against the Holy Roman Emperor. Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, so in 1504, there's another war and uh, again, this time with Maximilian, Louis the Twelfth, Ferdinand, who rules Sicily and Sardinia, captures Naples, uh, becomes uh, ostensible monarch of that. Um, Charles is elected emperor, Charles V. Uh, in 1521, he is now ruler of Austria, Spain, and the Low Countries, and he expels the French from Milan. He defeats Francis I at the Battle of Pavia, which you see here. Uh, this causes great concern to all sorts of people, especially the Pope and the Italian states, who form the League of Cognac to uh, oppose Maximilian, essentially. Um, and this begins the War of the League of Cognac, um, which involves uh, France, the Pope, Venice, England... Milan, Florence, uh, all basically opposing Charles V. Uh, but this is the height. Charles! Charles V! Um, he was, again, son of Maximilian I. Um, and he inherited, as I mentioned, all of these different domains. So he's now ostensible ruler of the Burgundian Netherlands. Uh, co-monarch first of Castile and then the first king of Spain. Uh, this po these possessions also include the West Indies uh, and the Aragonese kingdoms of Naples, Sicily, and Sardinia, all part of the Aragonese crown. Um, of course, after his father Maximilian dies, he inherits Austria and succeeds him as Holy Roman Emperor. So he's an extremely powerful and threatening monarch who has designs on basically all of Europe, and he might as well. He's got uh, dynastic claims to half of them. Uh, and this is not... The, the height of the Habsburgs will come later, but this is the beginning of the... Um, well, actually, this might be the height. This is a pretty good time to be a Habsburg, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, and Charles V is both heir of the House of Habsburg and Holy Roman Emperor. Pretty powerful dude. Um, so, when the Pope... Uh, takes up arms against Charles V. Um, he puts together an army to basically chastise the Pope and bring him into line. Say, hey, Pope, sit down, shut up, and do what you're told. Um, 
So he puts together an army of a about 10,000 um, Landschnechten, Land, Landschnecht, um, a handful of Spaniards, and an unknown number of Italian infantry. They were also joined by a lot of hangers-on and... Um, really people who could smell blood in the water there there were a lot of people joining on this army because they could they could tell that it was going to win and they were led by this man um duke charles who had dis- distinguished himself as <sighs> i uh i often wonder about uh owning well, about owning land in general, but also owning so much land. And um, just because you inherited it, I mean, I suppose if you're, I suppose this makes sense in this time period, because if you're a, your average peasant or serf, it doesn't really matter who your monarch is, but it does seem weird that everybody just said, sure, um, this land was inherited by Charles the whoever, and now... It, we're part of the the Habsburg dominions, but yeah, it's 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 kind of mind boggling. Um, so Charles, this guy Charles, uh, Duke Charles, not Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, um, was distinguished himself in the Italian wars and had been serving the French, uh, but be he really was too much of a cool dude uh he was duke of bourbon couldn't find out what he charles the duke of bourbon um he was appointed constable of france by francis and was granted governorship of milan but was recalled because they did not like how powerful and popular he was so he made a secret agreement to betray the king and give his services to Emperor Charles V. And they were going to partition France. However, this plan never came to fruition, and he was stripped of his offices and proclaimed a traitor, fleeing to Italy in 1523, where he entered officially into the imperial service of Charles V. The emperor gave this Charles, Charles III of Bourbon, Duke Duke Charles, not Emperor Charles, um command of this mixed Spanish German mercenary army and sent him to show the Pope what was what. Uh, This part of the war is pretty uh, short lived to be honest. Um, Charles here almost immediately defeats the Italian forces in the field and arrives at the walls of Rome. However, as I mentioned, um, the monarchs of this time period had a cash flow problem pretty frequently, and this is one of those times. So even though the army is victorious, there were no funds available to pay the mercenaries. They had not been paid for the better part of a year, uh, not only had not had they not gotten wages, uh, they were often hungry. Uh, they didn't have food. They didn't have supplies. And so the roughly 30,000 imperial troops mutinied, and they forced Charles the Bold, this fellow here, not Charles the Bold, Charles, Duke of Bourbon, Charles the Bold was the Burgundian guy who died. Sorry, there's too many Charleses. I, I wish that it weren't the case, but it is. Um... And forced them to, forced Charles, Duke Charles, to march on Rome. Now, the defenders of Rome were about 5,000 militiamen and 200 Swiss guards against uh, at least 30,000, 20,000, somewhere in that number, 20 to 30,000 imperial troops, mostly mercenaries, hungry, angry and uh, looking for some uh, loot. 
uh, basically looking for payment. And they arrived in May of 1527 and almost immediately took the city. Um, there was a brief battle where this guy, Duke Charles, was fatally wounded. Um, for all of his failings as a leader, um, he did not lack for bravery, uh, and he, by all accounts, led the charge and breached the walls of Rome, where he took a arquebus shot to the chest and died heroically. I mean, is it brave if you're heroically sacking a city? I don't know. I don't think so. But, you know, he had um, he had physical courage for the for whatever that counts for. Um, and then it's pretty much open season on Rome. Oh, there's, um, there's, I, I want to share a little anecdote from this, um, initial part of the siege. Um, the defenders, again, these are mostly militia, Roman citizens, some small number of, uh, Swiss guard, the Swiss guard, sorry, in, in case you're not aware, are the personal armed um, guards of the Pope. Uh, they're still there. They wear funny clothes. You can go and see them at the Vatican. They're, yeah. Um, but they've been around for ages. Um, when they were defending the city, uh, one of the things they were said to have shouted down at the mercenaries was that they called them Jews, infidels, half-castes, Lutherans. Um, these are the worst insults that they could muster for the invaders. Um, so shortly after the Duke falls, they breach the, um, breach the outer walls of Rome and they are into the city. And these men are professionals. Um, this is a good question, J. Betty. Um, so... Rome is a city of about 50,000 people at this point in time, um, which is, as you may know, a real um, diminishing from its height under the Roman Empire when it was at least um, 100,000. Um, and, God, do I want to say... Somebody's going to get this on YouTube and call me wrong, but I think it was a million at a point. Anyway, um it isn't, you know, a backwater. It's a, not a nowhere, but the this is not one of the finest places in Italy or in Europe at this point in time. But it's not going to get any better because uh, the sack is... Ooh, it's bad. Um, there's the invaders make their way into the city of Rome and uh, they begin their looting, their pillaging, their rampaging. Um, there's a very famous, well, it's famous. There's a famous story or famous tale uh, that I haven't been able to find actually much official um, evidence on. So this might be a, um, this might be, you know, just a, a fun story, but uh, accordingly, according to legend the swiss guard made their last stand in the teutonic cemetery uh within the vatican um bravely holding out against uh the emperor's troops so that clement could escape through a secret passage to the castel de saint angelo which is where he did escape to um it was supposed to be just 42 swiss guard uh, under the command of Hercules Goldie, um, bravely giving their lives in uh, defense of the papacy. Anyway, it's a there's a great Sabaton song about it. You should listen to it. Um, anyway, uh, it's not a bad question. It's a good question, actually. I, I kind of skipped over talking about the Italian states and about Rome, but even uh, with all of the wealth of the papacy and all of the investment by these powerful Italian families. Rome itself is inferior to Milan, to Venice, uh, even to, to Naples. Um, it is still symbolically powerful, but in terms of actual population and wealth, it's a pretty, 
it is very much a shell of itself. Um, and this is a low point for the Italian states in general. They have been fighting these wars for decades now and it's not coming out very well. So, no, it's a good question, and, and thank you for asking. Um, so, I don't want to go into too much detail about the sack itself because it's gruesome, but I'm going to talk about it some. So, big time content warning, but I'm going to talk about some very unpleasant things here in um, the, the next few minutes. But basically, the next few days was an orgy of violence. Uh, priests were murdered. Um, nuns were raped. Uh, everyone was murdered and raped. Um, the, there were a large number of Lutheran sympathizers among the German Landschnecht. You'll remember that's where the Luther, the Protestant Reformation began. Many of the mercenaries were Lutherans and they committed, uh, a lot of what we would call, or what the church would call sacrilege, they slaughtered an elderly priest because he refused to grant communion to an ass, to an ass, excuse me. Um, they beat a cardinal and dragged him through the street. They trampled communion hosts underfoot. They uh, brought out the sacred heads of mummified saints and shot them with arquebuses. Uh, they stripped the churches of their riches. They dumped ancient bones into um, the gutters. Uh, they ripped open the papal tomes in, sorry, tombs in St. Peter's. Uh, they used the basilica as a stable for their horses. Um, so on and so forth. And um, yeah, it was uh, it was bad. One commentator wrote that hell itself was a more beautiful sight to behold. Um, Clement again had retreated to the castle of St. Angelo nearby and could do nothing. Um, the sack for three days was especially intense, but it took eight months for the city, for the army itself to leave the city. Um, and by the time it had done, uh, the population had dropped from 55,000 to somewhere. I have read differing reports, um, as low as 10,000, but maybe 20 or 30,000, um, it seems definitely likely that about half of the citizens of Rome were either killed, driven off, or uh, displaced, or later died from diseases or other health issues related to the ongoing sack of Rome. Um, and the consequences of this event are far-reaching. Um, it's kind of again it's shocking it's um the you know it's a uh, frankly a hideous desecration of the holiest site in Christendom or one of the holiest sites in Christendom um and really there's there's immediately like not a lot of consequences not a lot of um you know there's not a an ultimate outcome because these are, are mutinous troops right Charles V condemns this. Luther condemns this. Uh, all of the, the monarchs say, oh, gosh, this is so terrible. Um, but, you know, the leader, Duke Charles, is dead. Um, a lot of the, you know, independent soldiers either can't be found or um, make off with their loot. And really what happens is that Clement... Uh, the seventh, he's taken basically a prisoner of war. He gets Charles V gets what he wants. Basically, he brings the Italian states to heal, um, expands the power of the Holy Roman Empire. And um, Rome itself is laid low and it takes uh, centuries for the city, especially to recover. But it's basically this is the end of any sort of. Um, aspirations of independence for Italy itself until the um, until basically Italian nationalism in the 19th century. Uh, that's how that's how devastating this is to the idea of Italian independence. Uh, from here on out, Italy will belong to a series of crowns. 
uh, north and south divided between various dynasties. Um, there's also some interesting knock-on effects. This is exactly when Henry VIII is trying to convince the Pope to annul his marriage with Catherine of Aragon. Um, and, well, she's, by the way, the aunt of Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, and you might imagine that uh, Clement VII is not enthusiastic about granting uh, that particular um, annulment. Uh, and hence, we have the Anglican Church, more or less. Um, the conqueror of Peru, uh, Francisco de Carvajal, uh, got his start in this, well, not his start, but one of his, uh, he cut his teeth in this siege. Um, he actually seized a bunch of documents from a notary and then um, basically ransomed them, which helped finance his later expositions into Peru. Um, but ultimately, this represents a, a power shift towards the Holy Roman Empire, away from the Pope, uh, and it also marks a turning point in the Reformation, a, a major schism, or a more serious schism between Protestants and Catholics. Um, the disagreement became much more violent, and a lot of the... Uh, unpleasantness here would lead directly into further um, religious wars. So, like I mentioned at the beginning, there really isn't, there's no major takeaway here. There isn't any sort of like tidy bow. It's just a, um, you know, a gruesome orgy of violence carried out by hungry, angry, unpaid mercenaries. Uh, which happens, frankly, quite a lot throughout history. But sometimes you hear, here's my take on it. Sometimes you hear certain types of people talking about uh, the threat to the West, uh, the, you know, the, the downfall of Western civilization, you know, the, um, the, the barbarians at the gates. Um, but the truth is that the greatest threat to the West's holy places, um, centers of civilization has always been from other parts of the West. I have spoken before about the uh, sack of Constantinople by Crusaders in, 12, in 1204, and this, the greatest, most awful desecration of uh, holy Catholic artifacts and, you know, trampling of uh, the faith, happened by other Christians. Many of them were Protestants. Not all of them were. Some of them were Catholics. And there's no, again, there's no big lesson here. Nobody learned any lessons. The wars didn't stop because of the sack of Rome. Uh, in fact, they just got worse, uh, which I guess is, I suppose, a lesson in and of itself. But I think that this is a really critical moment for understanding people's motivations, uh, understanding the early modern period, and understanding um, a lot of how people behave and how we got to where we are today. Um, a lot has been made of sort of the, the debt element of this, which I think is important uh, as a driver of this event, but not the only thing. There's, of course, also religious conflict and um, uh, the mismanagement and um, all sorts of other minor things that go into... Uh, you know, crowd behavior, uh, why this happened. Um, but ultimately, it's a deeply unpleasant, violent, and uh, difficult moment in history. Uh, so thanks for listening to me talk about it. Um, I don't know what my next talk is going to be on, but uh, it's nice to be back. Thank you all for coming and for listening. Um, and yeah. Uh, watch this space, catch me on Twitter or Instagram, and um, there'll be more Radical History soon. Thanks, everybody. Have a great w weekend, and I'll talk to you soon.